go. So welcome everybody. Welcome to this webinar where um, I'm going to demonstrate how to paint a new forest landscape. So my name is Angela Corbin and I'm teaching here at the New Forest Art School. Uh, so I'm based in Fordham Bridge in the New Forest and so the scene I'm going to paint today is from a, a beautiful place not far from here where I go to walk and I go out there painting and I take people out there painting for workshops and outdoor exercises. So um, I'm going to demonstrate to you in stages. I'm going to talk through the process at every stage of how to do this. Um, you are most welcome to ask questions. So I'm going to hand you over now briefly to Ian. And Ian is fielding the calls today. So uh, he'll explain a little bit more about how you can ask questions to me throughout the demo. Over to Ian. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, just uh, to run you through, if you haven't done a, a webinar now before, it's slightly different to a normal Zoom meeting um, where you'll only be able to see me hopefully in a small box at the top of the screen and then the main, the main screen is going to be Angela's paintings. Um, if you need to um, ask any questions, um, you've got the chat button down the bottom of the screen if you click on it. And before you start writing your um, question, if you just make sure that in the two box, if, if it says all, all panelists or all panelists and attendees, it, it, it doesn't really matter. And I should be able to uh, pick it up um and yeah um so questions at the end yeah 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 we'll have time 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 permitting we'll have we'll have we'll have a question and answer setting at the end uh we will have a break at 11 o'clock for five uh um 10 minutes at 11. um and, and we'll, we'll continue then okay yeah okay so Thank you. Oh, I just want to say, just just before you start, I know Marsha has been having. I can only see and hear Angela. Hi, Marsha. Can you can you type in if you if everything is working now for you? Just just type drop something in the chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think everything's working. Okay, Angela. Yeah, yeah. we're good to go. Right, so first thing I'm going to do is show you my drawing and my original head, painting. Head, head back from the camera, Ange, because we can't really see you. All Sorry. the way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I won't, be, I won't be speaking to the camera throughout the demo. You, you'll see the painting <laughs> and I'll be talking to you. But just before we get started, yes, yeah, so I'm going to take you through the stages. I'm going to show you the drawing and I'm going to show you the painting. So drawing. Um, so what I always do before I paint any scene is I like to use charcoal to create a little line drawing and also add some tone in so I can understand um, where everything is placed in the landscape. Um, actually, I need to show you the original painting. So you've probably seen this on the website, no doubt. This is um, the original painting. So that's what we're aiming for, something like that, which um, captures the feel of the new forest. It's quite impressionist and it's really about using brush strokes. So before I paint this, I'm understanding what I'm going to be painting by creating a drawing. So I'm working from a photograph today. The photograph is here. And what I basically have tried to understand is on my photograph, where about from top and bottom of my canvas, where is the top of the hill, the skyline? And I've also located halfway on my photograph. So I can also locate halfway on my canvas or my drawing. And I've also tried to understand the height and the position of this tree, because the tree here is quite key because it's a, a marker, if you like. Sometimes you can get a bit lost with all these layers. Um, so if we have got something to refer back to, we can see against the tree where each of the layers are positioned. And what I always do is I always simplify everything into shapes. So sometimes it's useful to take your hand and to literally feel or flow your hand across the shapes. 
Um, so we've got the panel at the back, and then we've got this small heel here, and then we've got a middle section where most of the heather is, and then we've got a band of the ferns and the path at the front. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put that aside. You can see that in the in the corner of the screen, hopefully. And this is the sketch that I made, same size um, paper as the canvas I'm going to work on. That's really important. The canvas I'm working on is 30 centimetres by 40. So A3 paper is quite good for that, same size. And here's the halfway line, just about here. So I could then work out how steep this panel at the top is. And I put the tree in early on. And here we've just got a suggestion of some of the shapes of the ferns. So it's useful using charcoal because I'm also in this drawing, just try to put in loosely with the edge of my charcoal where some of the darker shapes are going to be in the painting. Um, you could print the photograph in black and white or you could squint at it, but darks are quite important in a painting and they're going to help to give a bit of movement and depth in the picture. Um, when I get to painting the ferns and the, and the heather, I might tell you a bit more about how I simplify them. Basically, I'm, I'm just, most things are going to be linear, but some of these heather shapes here, I'm painting them as kind of pyramids or little um, oval mound shapes. So I'm just trying to simplify. That's something I teach a bit more in my workshops, but it's it's a, a really important part of this style of painting, I think. And we've got some little dark shapes at the front. So the red pen I've put on, hopefully you can see some of the shapes that I'm working with. Okay. So that's going to translate to this. I don't know if it's quite handy to see them side by side. Can you see the dark greens? They correspond to some of the dark charcoal marks. And we've got the panels. It's easier when you're painting because you can use colour to differentiate each band of the landscape. Okay, I am going to try and get the path at the front. I have purposely try to create a bit of a point. It goes to a bit of a point on the left, rather than being completely flat and open. So the path kind of begins to get thinner as it comes this way. And some of my strips of the landscape are also going to get thinner. So this one here is gonna to come to more of a point. That gives a bit more um, depth in the landscape than if you've just got completely horizontal bands. So drawing aside, we're going to move on to the canvas and I will show you my paint. Okay, so um, if you are quite new to this, and even if you're more experienced, you probably, if you're more experienced, you probably have discovered that painting onto a canvas often gives you better results than working onto paper. But certainly with acrylic paints, I find the canvas is really useful. The paint doesn't seem to dry quite as quickly on there. So something with acrylics, it, um, if, especially if you're new to them, they dry very quickly. That can be good because if you want to paint over something and correct it, you can do it instantly. But if you need a bit more time to play with the paint, it does dry. Um, so I would suggest using a canvas. That one is by Frisk. Um, I can put that into a, a document with the recording from the SAA. And I've just given it a little coat of very, very diluted burnt sienna acrylic paint. So it's not white, it's like a very soft um, beigey colour. And that's just because often with my landscapes, um, I like to work on a neutral colour. White is sometimes a bit harsh. Okay, so briefly talk about the paints. So this is what's called a stay wet palette. And it's basically a plastic box with blotting paper and a membrane, which has a lid. So I can put all my acrylics in there 
and when I finish with them I can leave them for a couple of days and I can come back and use them again. So I'm using um, a mixture of acrylic paints at the moment but mainly they are um, Atelier Interactive. I've got a couple of paints in there from De La Rowney System 3. Basically I'm using up some of the colours I've got. So in there, I have got a couple of blues, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue. I've got two yellows, cadmium yellow, yellow ochre. To get this mauve colour of the heathers, um, there's a couple of colours that could be very useful without mixing. There's a processed magenta. So this pinky purpley colour is perfect for what we need. I've also got a crimson, which is a deeper red. If I need to make the, the heather brighter, um, that's actually a, um, a bright magenta. It's um, opera rose. That's a very bright pink. I've got titanium white and I've got two browns here, burnt sienna, which I use quite a lot in my paintings and burnt umber. So if, if that sounds like quite a lot, um, You'll get a, you can get a list after the, the, with the recording to make it a bit clearer. Mixing colours on this palette with a knife so I can mix on there. I recommend using something like an acrylic retarder. It's a gel that you mix with the paint. This is going to be your friend. It's going to give you more time to mix. And as we get, it's getting warmer, um, this is perfect to stop your paint from drying too quickly. I also have a water spray. That's uh, just a, a spray that I bought from just a high street. Um, I think it was from Superdrug actually. So you can put water in there and you can spray your canvas if it's drying a bit too quick or spray your paints. Okay, um, I'll tell you about the brushes and I'll go through this as I go. So most of my brushes are synthetic, meaning they are um, quite smooth to touch, but they've got a spring in them. They're snappy. So acrylic paint uh, brushes need to be a bit stiffer than watercolour ones to hold the paint. And my style is quite impressionist. So the brush strokes and the shape of each brush is crucial for me. Um, you can play around and experiment and work out what works for you, but Different shaped brushes will give different shaped foliage. So that's a filbert. Um, large flat, that's good for the sky because it doesn't leave brush strokes. I've got um, a couple of round brushes. So these more pointy ones, which are great for detail or for the individual ferns. I've got a very small, fine brush called a rigger. And that might make it a little bit easier to create the very fine lines for the, um, the tree. Okay, I can go through more as we go. I also have a sponge. So I think some of this could be done with a sponge. If you like that type of thing, you might be able to create some of the foliage with a sponge in an experiment. All right, we'll get started. So. This is dry, the base has gone down, diluted burnt sienna. So I, I scoop my paint out from the, here and put it from the palette and put it onto the mixing palette. So first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna sketch out the composition. So I've had a practice, I've drawn it on paper. So I'm more confident now about what I wanna do. So a little round brush because that is like a pencil. If you're scared of this, you could use a watercolour pencil and sketch it all out with a watercolour pencil. I encourage my, my students to try it with a brush because it will make you more free eventually. If you make any mistakes as you go uh, or need to alter things, I alter things all the time. Damp rag or tissue with water and you can wash it out as you go if you make a mistake. So a little bit of burnt sienna on my brush and on here, just bring some water to it. And I'm just gonna sketch out, just like my sketch, my key shapes. Um, make it quite diluted though, because yeah, it, I don't want it to stick out like a sore thumb. 
I'm going to very gently draw in what I call the, it's a skyline, horizon line here, just as we, where the sky meets the, the ground. Um, goes in. I'm going to, I'm going to actually put where the tree is really early on because that the tree trunk positions into the foreground so we can see from the height of the tree trunk where everything else needs to go. That's going to go in here. I'm not going to paint the tree up into the sky because I have to paint almost painting background to foreground. Um, so what I can do is just mark roughly the height of it. That's going to go in there. Okay, so now I can go, I'm going to carry on from here and I'm going to work out from this down to here, we've got another hill coming down this way. It goes behind that tree. And then this in front of here, we've got, it goes away from us slightly. It's kind of going that way. You can alter this a bit once you start painting, but I would say you need to try and get this how you want it early on. If you've got your drawing right, you're going to feel more confident about the whole painting. And this is the pink bit in here. As soon as we start getting some colour in, it will be much easier to um, understand where you're going. If you're worried about that from the beginning, you could you could begin to just that's like a little reminder, that's going to be the pinky bit in there. So these uh, ferns at the front, I'm literally just going to draw them as little shapes at the moment. So right at the front, we've got a couple of shapes of these um, heather and the heather comes up and down. Um, it undulates, it's height undulates, so I can undulate slightly the shape I'm making. See, I, my style of painting is more, I'm kind of creating the shape with dark and light and with brush strokes. So as long as I've got the shapes in the right place, I'll do most of the work with the paint. So tree here, and we've got these ferns in front of it. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of fern shapes at the front. And they kind of, they're going to come up down. We've got like little kind of pyramid shapes, the little domes. I'm just getting a feel for a couple of those at the front. They kind of, where they stop, these ferns, that creates the gap where the, the path is through here. Did I, say? I did say I was going to try and make the path go to a point, didn't I? So I probably need to have some ferns or something in here. Okay. Some more behind there. There's a little line of trees in here. I'm just trying to keep it super simple to start with. A few trees on here. And this probably will change a little as I develop it. Check my tree trunk. Right, stand back. It's a very good idea to keep standing back throughout your painting to see it from a distance. Right, don't like that line there. So I can get a bit of water on my brush and um, get rid of that. Tree comes up here. Back here, here. Okay, so that's pretty much what I want. I'm going to get started with putting in the colour now. 
So the way that I work, I do what's called blocking in. So each shape roughly gets a kind of base colour with the correct colour and tone. And I work across the whole painting and then I come back and I put more detail on kind of a second time round, if you like. So we're going to start with the sky. Sky, that's going to need a large brush, so a large flat, size 10 or something. And I'm going to work broadly across here like this. So I've got titanium white. I'm going to scoop quite a lot of that onto my palette. And I'm just going to dilute it with a tiny bit of water on my brush, but not much. So the paint's going to be a bit thicker now we start to paint. And I'm going to load my brush up and roll it in that white. So white will cover almost anything with acrylic. So if you've made a mistake or want to correct something, the titanium white will do that. I'm just going to begin to roll this, so making a bit of contact with the brush. Um, if I wasn't being filmed, I might stand a bit further back here, but using the brush further down its, its uh, handle is useful to get a freer movement. I'm arcing it slightly. Contact with the paint, uh, the canvas. I'm actually going to take that all the way up to the top because when I paint my skies, I quite like um, to put the clouds in onto a loose white base because the clouds then kind of dissolve into the sky. Let's do this because it's slightly wobbling. Right, so into this, you can see we're going to need a bit of colour. So the main blue I'm using for most of the painting, but not all of it, is cobalt blue, which is a lovely violety blue. So mix a bit more white. I'm going to pick up a tiny bit of cobalt blue, and that's going to go in with that white. Mix it up, and I've got a lovely colour to start to put in some of the clouds. Now there is a slightly darker blue at the top of the painting, it's a bit more grey. I'm going to put a little bit of ultramarine blue onto the corner of that to make a darker version of it. So ultramarine blue, cobalt and white. I might even try a little speck of the magenta. Just so the whole painting's got a slightly mauvey feel to it. If you're new to all this, it's worth just giving yourself a bit of time to play around with colour mixing. Using the same brush, I'm going to load it with my cobalt blue, my light colour. I'm just going to put the clouds down. I'm kind of going to draw the shape. I'm wobbling my brush a little bit. Now, because the, the white paint is almost dry, but it's a bit sticky, and that allow me to have softer edges on the bottom of my clouds. And don't worry too much uh, if you're working at home and uh, so if you're new to this um, and the paint dries, you can still paint clouds. Um, you could use a water spray maybe on the bottom of them just to soften the edge and I often use my finger to just smudge the edge. So the clouds tend to roll up, so I'm just going to create a bit more of a, a lift so they're not completely flat. There we go. So a lot of painting, I think, is about confidence, getting confident with your brushes. I'm having to take my brush all the way across so we don't get too much streakiness. Right, let's go a bit darker. So we're going into that ultramarine mix now. And that's coming in on top of here. Swoop it down a bit. I brush on the edge and I'm just playing with it a little bit. And then stand back. So 
I think with a photograph, it's hard to recreate the sky exactly. Um, this guy is quite quite a nice one. It's not, not, not too much happening, but it's better just to go with the flow and the feeling of it. Um, I'm going to add a tiny speck of burnt sienna into my ultramarine blue and white mix. It's not quite grey enough for me. So I'm just going to go back and just make a bit more contrast. It's not actually a grey sky, but we've got some more depth in it than just a light sky. Better. It's subtle, isn't it? And that's showing up that much on the screen. Yeah, that that can be annoying with acrylic. Sometimes you get patches where your brush marks are. Um, you either need to leave the paint dry a little bit and then work back into it, or take your brush all the way off the canvas. I'm going in with a bit of white, with a tiny bit of that light blue, and I'm just gonna. Actually, while this is still damp, I'm just going to put more white in the top. You just lift your brush at the end like a feather and blend it. So the canvas has been kind to me today. Quite a nice canvas, this one, so I can make my marks and it also allows me to. Oh, that's a mistake. Picked up some pink by accident. Be quite nice actually. Bobble. Okay, so skies in. Yeah, it makes a difference actually if, if the bottom of your clouds are neat or if they're a bit wobbly. Um, it's basically the difference between a more of a, a rain cloud or a more calm day. Need a bit more. So with that burnt sienna base, the colour of the canvas is showing through, but which can be really nice. I'm actually going to make it a bit cooler. Another layer of white. So I think it's important to have um, plenty of space to mix your colours with. I've already picked up a couple of colours that I didn't want. I need to a couple of palettes to mix on make life a bit easier than just the one so you don't get into too much of a pickle with all the colours. There, I'm just great, I'm just making a slightly more sharper edge under that cloud. What's that? Quite subtle. Okay, um, so moving on, we're going to move down the page. Now the really good thing about using a limited palette, which I'm using, is that often the sky colour will work into your greens. So my greens are going to basically be at the back of the painting, but going to have the sky colour, so cobalt, blue and white. And I'm just going to put one or two of my yellows into it. So for the background, it's not such a bright green. So I've got cobalt, blue, white and yellow ochre. That's going to give us a very dull, soft green, sagey type of green. And you can mix more blue or more yellow to make it stronger or not. So I know some people here are probably more experienced, but uh, just covering all. So it's important to get make time to play with mixing your colours, I think, because it can be the difference between a bit more blue or a bit more yellow, um, whether, whether you get what you want or not. So I've gone for this filbert brush, I'm still using large brushes, and I've loaded up the paint, and I'm going to stroke the paint along the landscape. And this is where, if you can imagine you're kind of walking down the hills, or you're walking into the picture, which way would you be walking? Because your brush will describe the contours of the valley. So brush strokes can be really useful. 
So I'm going to just get the point of this brush is useful. And actually, at this point, uh, if you're a beginner, you might want to go to a much smaller brush just to get the top line how you want it. If you're more experienced, you can use the edge of the brush or the point of the brush. I'm just going to wobble that colour down. Now it needs a little bit more ochre, yellow ochre in it. It needs to be a little bit more warm, khaki, tidy, mossy. And this is quite a good sized canvas to manage, but you'd get a more expressive painting on a larger canvas. Um, okay, so the paint's a bit thicker now, so I'm hoping to do this without too many fiddling about with the brush strokes. It's kind of going at the back. Um, and there are a couple of hills that go the other way in here. So I've come across these ones like that. Okay, as we come forward, I'm just going to begin to add a little bit of the cadmium yellow to that mix. I've got cobalt blue, white, and a bit of yellow ochre. Because as we come forward, the landscape tends to become stronger, brighter often warmer. Um, so I'm now going to come over to the second layer, the other hill. I know you're probably thinking, oh, there's lots of mauve in there, but I'm going to stroke the mauve over the top of this. Right, paint's too thin. But as I'm brushing, I can see the canvas through it. So to make it more exciting and less work, for me and you. I'm going to put the paint on thicker or less diluted. It's like uh, yogurt consistency. Right, reload. We're going to lose a bit of a tree now, that's okay. I'll paint that back in, that, that will happen with this style of painting. Uh, okay. Dabbing a bit on my palette, I'm just going to... Sometimes if you don't wash your brush too well, but if I'm doing all the greens at, at once, it's more natural, you can actually roll so I've got my green here, which has got much more yellow in yellow ochre, but there's the one with less yellow ochre. And sometimes you can roll your brush in two colours, and that creates a very interesting natural brush stroke across. So when we get the darker trees in, that will also differentiate the valleys, one area from another. Some trees in here. Okay, I'm just going to put the slightly lighter greens in at the front and then we're going to go for some detail. So as we come forward, the greens get brighter. So they're a bit more spring colour. So I'm not going to use yellow ochre anymore. I'm going to switch more to the process yellow, which is um, like the cadmium yellow, with cobalt blue and a little bit of white. So you can see it's a more springy colour as opposed to that one. I'm still using a large brush. I'm on my filbert shapes. I like these ones. Damp brush, a little bit of water on it, but otherwise I'm just using the paint quite neat. So now I'm going to begin to pull in. There's like a, oh, it's a bit too bright. More white needed. I'm going to begin to pull in some of the uh, layers of the ferns. 
and I've got my brush on its side and I'm wobbling it, wiggling it kind of up and down. So it's a little bit more movement. And I'm not really smoothing the, the brush strokes out too much. So part of this style uh, will be putting in little lifted brush strokes, um, more impressionist style actually, where within each area, there's a bit of movement because you can see a few little brush strokes. So just going to create some little wave little shapes almost. They're kind of S shapes, dabs to create some movement in there. And it's a slightly darker green. There's a bit more blue and a bit more yellow in that. So, I mean, at this painting you could do in the kind of panels. And that would be a good exercise, but to get a bit of interest in the movement, there's a few things we can do. And it may also be, you could try this type of thing with a sponge. You could try having a couple of blues on, uh, greens on, the lighter green and the slightly darker green. And you could just dab your sponge into that and you could lift and move to create, to see a feeling of foliage. Okay, I'm going to wiggle some through here because the pinks will go in. They'll be surrounded by some of the, the green. Yeah, I'm going to try and leave some cleaner areas for the pink to go in. So don't want too much green in there. So the pink's going to go in here. Um, so the path, the path is also going to be these colours, cobalt blue, a little bit of the cadmium yellow or process yellow, but lots of white. It's quite a minty, paler colour. So I'm going to put the path in before we put these bushes on top. And the path, we've got to think about everything we paint, whether we've got a vertical shape or a curve, or whether it runs flat. So when we're painting something like a path, we need to be thinking about it flush with the contours that you'd walk across. So the path is going to be painted with my brush quite flat against the painting. I'm going to try and pull left to right. Um, I don't mix the paint up very thoroughly on my on my palette, which I think helps because when you go to put your brush in, you pick up variations of a bit of the paint with more white or with less white. So when it comes out, it looks more interesting and not flat. But let's get that in kind of left to right. I'm making contact with the painting now. So you've picked up some of that kind of yellow that's in the brush because I haven't washed the brush yet. That's actually quite nice. Um, okay, so in the path, I think it will be more interesting to see some brush stroke movement, slightly lighter or darker, and it's a bit lighter here. So I'm using that variation in brush stroke to push you through there, the direction and also to create a bit of interest in some through here. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, green in this landscape, but I think you could play with it a bit. I do teach workshops on colour mixing um, and in the classes. I know greens. Um, when you're outdoors, there's a bit more to think about. So in the painting like this, we can play with it a bit more. I'm just standing back to see how it's looking. Okay, so I think once we get the darker greens on and the mauves, it will pull together even more. Everything's in the right place. So it's, and the tones, dark or light, not too bad. I need some darks in there soon. There's a whole strip in here of these ferns. How are we doing for time? It's uh, 22, 11. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to put a few darker greens in in a moment because they will 
form, I haven't put these ferns in yet, and they will form the under shape, the skeleton, if you like, of the green. So that's where we're heading to. That's where we are. So the darks need to go in, they're really important. And in the ferns, and actually in most trees and bushes, I tend to put my dark down first, very thinly, and then I fold the foliage on top because um, generally you get the shadow or the underside or something at the base and you, the light colors on top. So that's where we're gonna go to next. I'm gonna start to get some of the dark greens in. And then after the, probably after the comfort break, I'll fold some of the mauves in on top. So for the darker green, we're gonna stick with um, the similar palette, but I can switch to my darker blue, which is the ultramarine blue. So this is a good blue to use. These two are good together, cobalt and ultramarine, because they're both quite violety. So ultramarine blue is a dark, um, the violet thing, a base blue, but I use it a lot to make natural colour foliage and for my skies often. So if I pick a bright yellow to go with that, you'll get a medium green. If I pick a dull yellow, like yellow ochre, we'll get a really khaki looking green. Um, I'm going to put in, for the purpose of the darks, take that back, I'm going to actually mix a brown with the blue. So I've got, um, she's burnt sienna, which I'm mixing with ultramarine blue. So these two colours are going to mix and make an almost black colour, so it looks quite dark. I'll show you on here. So when any, any of these colours are put on with a bit more water, they do appear to be a bit lighter. So this is how it looks if I just dilute it with water and put it on thin. That's, as you can see. So thick paint, thin paint. So that's the same mix. It's, it's uh, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. So that could be good for the almost black, very dark greens. If it's not looking very green at all, you could try a tiny bit of uh, the cadmium yellow with it. But I'm trying, I'm just going to use the, the blue and the brown. Okay, so switching to, I'm still using my filbert brush. I'm going to, the paint's slightly diluted and in here, these are, what I'm seeing in these ferns is they're kind of almost, we've got the arcs of the top of the foliage and we've got these kind of dark bases on them. I think this one I might just do on, I might just show you on, on here. So what I'm looking at here for a lot of these fern shapes, they kind of come up like this. What we also see, we see lots of curves, which are the arcs on which the leaves sit. And within that shape, we've got these kind of arcs coming up. So these arcs with the foliage on will go on quite thick with a lighter green, with a small brush. But if I just put them down with nothing underneath them, it will look flat. So I need to put a darker shape underneath and particularly um, under these leaf shapes. So I'm working on this, this kind of shape. I'll show you one here. Um, so I've got the diluted dark green. So I've got a bit of water with it, so it's not too heavy. Um, and we're just going to create, we can create some height. So the shapes come up. So 
what I can say is it, it really does help if you're able to do some sketching from the photo before you paint or from life. So that's what I'm kind of basing them on. And we've got some taller ones in here. If you get used to making sketches, particularly the, the charcoal sketches, where you've got the shape and you've got where the darks are, you might use a white chalk, uh, chalk on an eraser to erase out where the, uh, the light areas are. Or height. Uh, it will help you to understand what you're painting. So that's um, the basic shape. I'm going to go in with a little round brush and I'm going to draw in a bit of an arc, which are the arms on which the armature on kind of which the, the foliage hangs off. So I'm going to kind of make that a bit more definite in places with a bit more of a, a small brush. And now we're going to put the lighter yellow, uh, the lighter green on top of that. I might need to suggest some of the character of just a few of the leaves with a more spiky, spiky shape. There's a reason why I'm doing it with thin paint because it's easier to fold um, and, and put the foliage on top of it. If you do this with very thick paint, you might find your, your marks are a bit too dominant. So now I'm going to go in with um, the light green, medium, medium green, cobalt blue and a bit of the cadmium yellow. That's kind of the medium green in fact. And a bit of white in it as well. Um, I'm going to create some leaf shapes. So the brush is quite loaded up with paint. I'm going to create some leaf shapes on top of that. Okay, uh, I've got a bit of white, a bit of cobalt blue and a bit of cadmium yellow. Maybe I'm just going to switch to a slightly small round brush, a little pointy brush. So this is where the foliage, um, you've got quite delicate little fronds, cow fronds, bone fronds, and the little delicate brush stroke that we need is a smaller round brush. The white is helping it to cover over that dark. So white, cobalt blue, and a bit of the yellow, process yellow. And that's going to go on. Create some shapes. So that it's kind of almost a silhouette shape, if you like. So the dark creates a bit more of a silhouette. I'm simplify it so you can hopefully understand what I'm doing. When I do end up painting like this, um, it's a bit more intuitive because I'm kind of adapting and correcting what I do all the time. Um, so we can get some individual fronds coming out on top of the dark. Now, the reality about painting anything in nature, I find, is that almost everything you paint to make it look real needs a dark, it needs a light, and it usually needs a kind of middle tone. So it might be if, if your dark and your light look too different, 
we can just go in with a middle green, which is the same mix, um, cobalt blue, um, cadmium yellow and a bit of white, but just with a bit more blue and a bit more white in the mix. So I may have to just fold some of that slightly darker green in through it. Uh, and this type of painting, you need to stand back and look, keep looking to see because it is it's not, because I'm not filling in accurate, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not carefully filling in a drawing, I'm drawing with the brush strokes actually. So you have to kind of stand back and think, okay, does that shape work? Does that look right? Does it need a bit more light? Does it need a bit more dark? So that's better with the middle green on. Okay, so if you were to try this at home, I'd get my dark in, then I probably would go for a middle green and then the light green. Try not to make it too complicated, but it needn't it need be. Depends what you want from it, really. That's all made from the, well, those two greens are from the same mix, basically. Just one has got more yellow and one's got more, um, yellow and white. The brush strokes are very important and darks are important. Don't be too scared of the dark as long as you don't put it in too thick. I probably need to put some more darks in to create more silhouettes in that. Right, let's move on to the front a bit more. There's some more foliage in here actually. Some at the front, same thing at the front. I'm getting my dark green in and we've got these bushes that come up and out. So vertical brush stroke, bring it up a little bit. And I do, I try to keep the brush moving a little bit. Again, in an area like that, you probably could use a sponge. Work quite well. Kind of scrubbing that in just to get some depth in and we can do some more brush strokes on top soon. Um, I'm excited about getting the mauve in. So yeah, I probably would have some mauve going if I was doing this on my own, but the mauve basically we're at the right stage because we need to get the darks in and then we'll weave some mauves in on top in a moment, but it should all really start to look quite exciting once the mauves get in. So I think whilst I've got that dark green on my brush, we'll stop probably in a few, in about five minutes, but this will brush and I'm just, you can practice this, but I'm gonna create some little trees that go along the boundary. So trees and bushes in a, landscape like the new forest are really are your friend because they almost will tell the eye if you sit them on the boundary between two parts of the landscape they immediately will tell the eye where um, one part of the, the land starts and another is and they will lead the eye through the painting so you can pick where you want the eye to go by picking which trees you put in and in, these, in the distance, all I can really do is get my round brush and a bit of the dark green, um, which was the uh, Burnt Sienna Ultramarine Blue and a little bit of the Cadmium Yellow. And I'm just going to create a little bit of a push up and down, just with the tip of the brush. I'm kind of making a little a curve shape, but it's not totally neat. I'm wiggling the brush a little bit. It is a bit like magic because, I don't know, it's, just, it, it's getting used to standing back and looking and think if you need more or not. If you don't need more, then, then leave it. Less is, less is better, less is more. 
that's creating the, the line of that those hills there. Um, something's going on here. There seems to be more layers of tree here. In the background, we don't really do much detail usually. So the brush strokes themselves will do it for you. Uh, and I, ex I expect if you're doing this, then probably you're going to want to have it all looking how you want it straight away. Well, don't panic. Uh, you know, you might think, oh, that's a bit of a mess, close up. I don't think it's a mess, but um, it's the impressionist style of painting. So actually the brush strokes are fine, but then they're, they're not completely neat, but they, they're, they're painted nicely. So that the thing is getting used to standing back and how does it look on the wall? So if you were to go into a, uh, an exhibition or something, you probably wouldn't be right up here. I certainly, well, get into trouble if you did that in the National Gallery or something, wouldn't you? So uh, learn to step back and see if it does the job or not. So, yeah, a lot of this is confidence really. So I'm creating little mounds with my brush, but I'm wiggling it a bit up and down. And on my palette, the, the paint isn't mixed thoroughly. So it, actually I can have a slightly lighter or slightly darker bit of green as I go. What we should have is a bit more of an understanding of depth. I'm, I'm gonna put my mauves on top of these. That will look better than I might need to do a little bit up here. Detail will be the next session. And I'm just going to put my tree trunk in with burnt umber and white. A little round brush, because I just, that's important, isn't it? We need to know where that's going to be. It's going to get some other colours on it when we come back. And it gets darker at the top, so I'll put burnt umber. For my dark, I'm using burnt umber and ultramarine blue at the top. It's getting it to a good place, so when we come back, it's uh, starting to... When you come back, it's nice to, to see the painting and actually understand where it's going. It's quite a good time to leave off. There. It's going to have other colours in it. Uh, okay, so probably a good time to stop for coffee and I need to change my water. So when I come back to do my mauves, I need clean brushes. So are we okay to come back at 10 past? Yeah, 10 past 10, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so we shall be here. We shall see you at 10 past 11. Right. Okay, I'm going to go for a slightly smaller brush, a round brush, so I can begin to show more individualised brush strokes. That, you can see things when they're closer to you. In the background, they're more generic and flat. As they come forward, we need to see a bit of character. So I'm going to load my brush up, and the paint's now thicker. It's kind of yoghurt consistency. And I'm going to begin to weave up and down to the impressionist style brush strokes to create a bit of movement. We're going to start to bring some of those pinks in amongst the greens. It's probably easier if you're able to stand up, that might help to make a more fluid brush stroke. A bit of movement hopping about. I've got to be careful, they're not too high. They're not, you know, a bit lower than that. So stand back and have a look. I'm adding some more white to the, the mix and I haven't cleaned my brush. I'm just going to dab and pull, move on there. And some of those are more mauvey. So into the same puddle of colour, I could add a bit more blue. I haven't washed the brush. I'm just rolling it in a few colours now. But this is more of an impressionist style painting.
Yeah, so it's a bluer, more bluey, flatter. So I'm using the brush flatter here, more of a bluey, mauvey area. To try some of that with um, with a sponge, maybe. Oh, Q-tips, those um, cotton buds. Just thinking of ways you could play about with this, depending on your style. I can weave and pull those in amongst the greens. So because the mix has got a bit of white with it, it is covering the green. Have a bit more texture in there too, because that's a bit flat. Okay, and push that into the back of those ferns there. Just peeking through here. So we've got a colour in here which is a, a fluorescent pink. Um, slightly um, what's the word? A bit get it is very garish. You could use a I'm just gonna oomph up the colour if you like, put a bit of that brighter few accents where, where the sun is catching. How are we looking? Okay. And whilst I've got that same colour, let's bring it to the front. And there's some darker and uh, purples in there as well, particularly at the front here. So I've got ultramarine blue with um, the process magenta. And I'm going to begin to put some of those. We've got some height. Yeah, I suppose painting. Um, ill-defined or undefined shapes. I'm, I'm trying to just work with dark and light and create some movement with my brush strokes. So don't be scared to play about with the brush strokes a little bit. So don't want them too flat. I want them to kind of meander. Let's see. Yeah. That's a little bit. So that could look a bit blobby, but that's where I need to get my little brush. What else could you do? You could actually use something like a knife even. And I'm going to, on top of the dark, just like we did with the phones, we're going to do a lighter version. Process magenta and white. You could use a knife. You could um, use the side of a knife and bring some shapes up on top. Move your knife about, scratch through it. I think that will always work better if you've got your dark behind it. So it works well at the front because we've got a bright pink heather which is silhouetted against the dark one behind it, which is why I get my darks in earlier on. Or you could use a fan brush. Hopefully, I'm just giving you a lot of ideas here. Hopefully, it's and, and this fan brush you just fan up and out, so it's quite good for some of these shapes that I'm working with. Try to match your brush to the shapes that you're working with that you see. This is all about brush strokes, really. This painting, okay. Um, so I'm going to have to come back to the greens in a moment because I need to get the tree in. And I feel like I also need to put some more green in this path. At the time it seemed fine, but looking at it now, it's these objects that they don't really connect to the, the green very well. So now we're moving on to some green again and we'll get the tree in. Um, so I need to mix up a cobalt blue. I'm going to mix it with a little bit of the ochre, yellow ochre. I'll get the tree in first because that's important that I finish that I think. So I've got cobalt blue and yellow ochre which makes a darker 
kind of green. We need to get the dark silhouette in at the back of the tree. And then we're going to put, like we did here, the lighter on top. I think I need to finish the trunk as well. So that trunk has got a little bit of pink in it, which could be all the colour reflecting on it. So I've got my burnt umber ultramarine blue. I've got my dark colour for the trunk. You could just do it brown, burnt umber. I'm going to do that again because it needs to be a bit darker. If you have a watercolour pencil, you could begin to sketch the shape of the canopy. But while that's wet, I'm just going to drop a little bit of the pink and the white in on its trunk. It helps it to fit into the painting. And it's a lot more interesting than a brown. So load the brush up, pull it through and lift it. So it's got a bit more interest in it. Um, okay, I'm going to wash my brush. And I'm going to, I'll show you how I do my trees. Obviously I've painted a lot of them over the years. So thoroughly suggesting and recommending that you sketch the canopy, the shape in with a watercolour pencil. The way I do it, and if you're more experienced, I've got a rigger brush. You, that's very useful for these very fine branches. You'll find it hard to do with paint without a fine brush. I've got my little number four round brush. I'm just going to bring up the canopy shape. So lots of water on the brush and I'm just using the point of the brush. Uh, I'm just going to begin to sketch the shape kind of falls this way more. But again, we've got the branches coming down to a point. I always put the branches in first. It gives you some structure onto which to hang the foliage like tinsel on your um, on the Christmas tree. Little rigger brush, using the point of it, you need to practise that, I expect. But just practice a little bit of water, see how you get lovely, fine, really fine little branches in there. Just going in. Okay, it might be scary, but I need to go a little bit darker, I think. So I'm going to put ultramarine blue into my burnt umber to make that dark that I had before. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make some darker shapes in there. Actually, you could spend a lot of time on this tree. I would allow plenty of time if you're going to have a go at something like this. But some of the branches are wonderful because some of them actually are quite light. And they're catching more of the light at the front. They've got more white. So I'm going to do some pinky. Some of the trees going to have pink and white in it. Actually, it's a bit more mauve. A little bit of artistic license, maybe. Okay. More light than that one. The light one. I'm loading my brush up. This little rig is just perfect for this. Right, let's get some foliage on here. And actually, the dark centre goes like in here. Okay, I'm going nice detail on this. More pink on there. See, the painting looks much more exciting when you've got brush strokes doing the work for you. Right, let's get the dark green in. So the dark green is going to go um, at the back of the skeleton. Round brush. So let your branches dry. Diluted darker green. And that I'm going to begin to tap in. You could use a sponge, a little sponge would be very good for this. 
and I don't want it heavy. I, I'm just going to use a kind of a tapping motion with the brush just to suggest some depth. Yeah, I would say experiment whether you prefer using a sponge or a brush. A brush is probably going to be a little bit easier to control. I can use some of those dark spots. What I also need to do on the extremities, I probably should be a little bit more careful. You don't need to paint every leaf, but if you give one or two leaf shapes accurately painted, the human brain can fill in the gaps. This is a little, um, tiny little filbert brush. It's a little rounded top, little tiny one. And I think that brush is quite good for some of the leaves at the bottom. I'm just going to allow some of those silhouettes to show. The brush is just, you can just tap it on. I'm going to try and have it all different angles so it looks natural, but just tap that on on top of your sponge. So you've got a few definite shapes on top of a fuzzy shape. It should begin, the brain should hopefully begin to start to see that as foliage. A bit more cobalt blues, you can, the greens, yeah, you can play about with the greens a lot. But I think the, the green's okay. Yeah, there's a lot more going on in here, isn't there? If your tree starts looking hugely different than the one in front of you, if it, if it, if when you stand back from the painting and it looks like a tree and it looks fine. It doesn't have to be a photographic copy. If it goes off on a tangent, go with it. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to keep it quite similar. So I'm clumping the foliage around placed branches. Right, let's go for a brighter green. So just like the ferns, you need to have contrast. So that lovely, um, the bright yellow, process yellow, um, cobalt blue and lots of white, and there's much more yellow in it than blue. So I'm still using, I'm going to now use my round brush. I'm going to begin to fold like tinsel. We're just going to drape up and down around and on top of those darker areas, darker could just use a sponge and you could just use the three the three different greens for the sponge if you make a mistake and you think oh I've made the tree too heavy it's too blocky you can actually paint the sky the whitey blue back over it and back around it that's why I like acrylics because they're very very forgiving you can play about a lot brighter, more yellow. Talk all the way through this, haven't I? If you've got any questions, you might want to be thinking about them now or, or putting them in the chat box. I know I've been talking all through this, haven't I? <laughs> a bit garish, but sometimes, especially with beginners, I think, uh, is, is contrast. You can get away with a lot if your brights are bright and if your darks are dark. I'm going a bit brighter with my bright to get a bit more sunlight in. The little bits on the outside, they've got yellow ochre in, they're a bit softer. Right, I want to do a bit more to this green here in a moment. How are we doing? The sky hole is what we call the gaps between the trees. We've got white and a bit of cobalt blue. And if you've gone too heavy, you can just paint a few little touches of the sky back around in, in between. I'm just showing you how it looks if you need to do something like that. Okay, a bit more 
dark green down here. Just need to connect the top to the bottom a bit better. You might even have to put more darks in. Yeah, more darks here. So I'm just going to get on with this and just put a bit more greenies in at the bottom. Not quite but connecting this to the ground, I need to put a darker colour or a bit more of a shadowy type green to mesh the bottom of these into the into the ground. And these cut the green back into them so they fit in. Also, I really don't like um, the ferns in the middle, they just need more variety. Yeah, so I stopped on for a minute. I'm just going free flow. Obviously, if you're a beginner, you're not expected to do all of this, but it might be nice for some people to see actually how I do paint when I'm not thinking too much. It's twenty two now. Yeah, that's fine. Well, I know I've almost finished. Just playing a little bit. I, I can see quite a few things I need to stand back and maybe work on, but not too bad. I'm just playing about trying to be free with the greens, which is um how I would usually paint. Breaking up the a bit flat. So brush strokes, even of a similar colour. Um can create interest in an area. We need, it needs to be darker up here. Let's see the layering process. Lighter goes behind there. So I'm freeing up a bit now because uh, you know I've done, I've explained hopefully, and now I'm moving in and just playing about a bit. a bit more energy into the picture I think. Now do we just need a few more highlights of some of those ferns? Probably we do. Um, that thing has escaped me. Trying to be real with this so you can see you know how it is how you can make corrections i'm going to get a few more arcs of the brighter ferns in and we're about to stop i think in a few minutes so we can have questions this is absolutely okay to go back and add and embellish a little bit in fact often you do need to do that The painting kind of evolves, it, it, it's not static. That's better. A bit more exciting now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
And there, but again, it, it's often you need three tones of green, a dark, a middle, and a light. So it really needs a missing a bit of a middle tone. Um, right. Possibly the rigger brush, I can just get a bit more character into the spikiness at the front. So in each section, your brush stroke can describe the character of what you're painting. And if you've lost that, you may need to kind of put it back. So this is my rigger brush. I'm kind of doing a small calligraphic line just to put the character of the plant in a few places on top of my shapes. It's more of a suggestion really than a, a literal. Some darks in there. Yeah. A brush. What are we doing? Literally stopping in about two three minutes. So I might have to use the rigger and just retrace some of the silhouettes of some of these ferns if they're not strong enough now. I'm doing an arc and then I'm doing you've got to be a bit careful about too much of this because it, it could look a bit like I've just stuck something on top so the way that I was doing it originally I was, I was fitting that the the arcs of the fern over the darks so they like here the dark canopy at the bottom and then the light sits over it so I'm going to try and stick with my original kind of um, shapes. A gap in there. It would look nicer if you could walk through that, wouldn't it? Might be enough. How's that looking? Foreground just needs to be a bit of breaking up. Yeah, the only thing with acrylics is you can probably fiddle quite a bit. Knowing when to stop, I think. Um, have we got any questions coming in, Ian? Um, not at the moment. So if anyone wants to type a question into the um, into the chat box, we'll more, more than happily pick it up over the next couple of minutes. I've seen something that I need to rectify. I mentioned at the beginning trying to avoid doing very parallel lines and this mauve is quite straight. If I just meandered it back into the distance a bit more, so we've got an expanding triangle. Very subtle that, but it, it actually would probably give a bit more depth to the landscape. It's sometimes very tiny things. I'm just going to take this back a little bit behind here. So you've got a bit more, the landscape expands out a bit more that way. Small things, they are always usually small things that change something from okay to much better. It's knowing, isn't it? That's, a, that's where I'm, I'm handy. And yeah, it will just be detail, just neatening up an edge. So these bushes actually should be, the green would be on top of those tree shapes. So now I can go back and check any edges are, are correct and neat. Maybe I could put another line of trees in the background. 
that is actually a much darker silhouette in here. And I never put trees in here, there's more in here. So I could probably play with doing more in here. Sometimes you don't need everything because that's quite busy already there. If I do too many brush strokes here, the silhouette of the tree is going to get lost. So I might have a little play with these heathers a bit more. I'm going to put some of the actual little tiny heather shapes on. Edges is just neatening up edges. Tiny little track in the background. You generally don't really want to, well, they kind of suggest it there, don't they? I've kind of got little trails going through here. They're quite useful in the new forest. You can put in the, the trails of the, the walking trails to describe the contour of the hills. Are we looking? Okay, so I might just step in and speak to the camera now, then I think. Well, we've got another 10 minutes left on this. I feel that you're coming to a natural end on it. I think I'm probably at the end of this because I'm probably just need to sit back and look. There's always little things, more texture in there. Yeah, it's just um, refining detail, really, that skyline. Oops. That needs to go, that was a mistake. Paying attention to detail, really. So I think um, I'm going to get myself down here and just talk to the camera for a minute. Oops. How's that? Back. <laughs> Towards the painting. Back. Back. Right. <laughs> Can you have so, a Call me more now. Okay, so, well, um, <laughs> if there are any questions, please do put them in or any comments as well. Um, I say I had tried to keep it quite um, logical, I suppose, with the greens and the mauves. I said it, you may find when you start the painting and do the blocking, some people might find it useful to get the strips of magenta in earlier than I did. If you find you're getting lost in the picture. Yeah, um, Angela, Angela Dunbar has, uh, has put a, a question up there. Is she said that she um, loved your colour palette choice. How important it is to keep the limited palette, but at the same time choose opposite complementary colours on the colour wheel? Uh, well, I think it's easier not to make so much mud if you've got a very limited palette. Uh, and my process is really just having a puddle of one colour, like the mauve, and make it lighter or darker, and the greens uh, similarly. Uh, but I mean, this it's is quite a it dictates a certain palette, doesn't it? The new forest, the heather. You could go much deeper violet, and you could go with more yellows and siennas in the in the fern. That would be a different time of year. Um, I, I think the palette. What's what's most important with the palette is this, is how bright it is versus how dark, rather than the limited palette. To be honest, I mean, I just like a limited palette because it keeps it simple, but. Um, you, you need the contrast, you need to have that really zingy, fresh green against the darks. One, one trouble that can occur with this style of painting is if you've got lots of darks down, if you don't go bright enough in your brights, the painting could look quite dull. I, I, I'm quite a contrasty painter, so um, that's why I'm working with these much more brighter, colourful lights. Yeah, so I think contrast is more important than palette, but a, a limited palette is always a good way not to end up with mud, I think. Um, 
Any other questions? No, not at the moment. So if anyone else wants to, wants to type anything, I'm just waiting. Yeah. So you can play about with the, all sorts of techniques on this. You could probably do quite a lot of this with a knife, a painting knife, and that's really fun. I'm scratching through. But I would always do the sketch and, and block in, fill each shape with the appropriate colour before you build on top of it. I think that's important. Um, you could use sponges and quite a lot of it, I think. And the drawing is important, so make sure your underlying drawing is correct. That is going to help you and put the shapes in. Definitely the solution, I think, putting shapes in. Um, so, yeah, if anybody would like to join me in the new forest, I am just finalising dates. I've already got a couple of um, places reserved and booked for some outdoor workshops where we can go out and paint like this. So I've got dates coming up in June, uh, weekdays and weekend and July. So I can do traditional painting so we can go outside and paint on plein air, which is amazing. So we just go somewhere like this and just sit out there. Um, the heather won't be out until later in the year, uh, but it's still, it's still rather lovely out there. And I've also got a different type of workshop, which I have taught a few times before, and I'm teaching a lot more in my, uh, in my experimental classes, which are called Responding to the Forest. And they're all about going out and just using different materials, mixed media, pastel, pencil, watercolor, anything you've got, and, and just connecting to the landscape through a little bit of mindfulness and playing with colour and texture, painting with leaves and twigs. Um, we do all sorts of things. We do a bit of drawing exercises and then we do a painting at the end. So I'm really, really excited about those. I think they'll just be really easy just to dip into and just have a bit of fun outside. Um, so they yeah, will yeah, be yeah, Just uh, put a comment up there, not muttering the question. It says, thank you, Nita Light and your colour. Um, her colour is open to help with her granddaughter about her homework after this. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, if you've got any other comments or anything later, do drop me a line. Yeah, I mean, it, some some acrylic paints, You um, also there's a, could be, sometimes the cheaper ones, um, they can, don't have a lot of colour in, so sometimes it's hard to make a brighter painting. Um, but yeah, it's worth considering jumping up to a brighter colour, which is why I've got I've got that magenta. You can buy a really bright pink, you can buy a lighter magenta as well. Um, and brush strokes, enjoy brush strokes. So you've got a bit of personality in there if you can play with the brush strokes a bit more, I think. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Oh, that's, that's nice. I'm very happy to help your granddaughter. That's lovely. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so five minutes, I think we might wrap up soon. I think I've probably covered most things. Um, so we'll get the recording to you later on. So you will have a recording from this as well. So you can refer back to that if you want to at any point. Um, that's right, Ian, isn't it? The recording of this evening. Yeah, depends on if I have to edit it or not. Um, okay. Just uploading it can take hours or a day. I mean, it'll be, it, it should be available tomorrow at, at the latest. Okay. Um, okay. Or possibly this afternoon and we'll 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 send a link out to everyone who's who signed up so it'll be there yeah. for you to watch it at, at some stage if it's if it's not today it'll be sometime tomorrow yeah yeah okay um so if you're interested in, in any more of what i'm doing then just go to the website there's this i think there's a sign a form there for this uh, newsletter i can let you know what i'm doing so i'm quite excited about oh, so all are about getting out uh, and be able to meet up with people again. But it'd be lovely to get outdoors and just do some lovely things with paint out in, in nature, I think. Um, it's exciting. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of was meant to say thank you to everyone. I, I think I, yeah, who has supported me through this. It's been a difficult year for everybody and especially for small business owners. So I'm very appreciative to everyone who's supported me in all their different ways. Thank you very much. I think we've kind of supported each other really, haven't we? Which has been rather, rather wonderful. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, so I shall say goodbye and uh, we will be in touch with you. Thank you for watching. Okay. Bye.